Hi everyone, welcome to the Sacred Musings podcast. It's episode 91. It is the 20th of July, 23. And today we are thinking about what we should make of artificial intelligence. So welcome to the podcast today, everyone. Um, yeah, we're thinking about artificial intelligence today, which is a topic I haven't really talked much about uh, on the podcast before. But uh, one or two articles this week uh, just made me made me think about it. So that's that's the main topic, really. Just trying to think about how we can generally approach the topic of artificial intelligence. You know, should we be worried about it? Um, what should we do in response to this kind of new technology? So, uh, just obviously only a brief overview, but that's what we're going to be thinking about in the main topic. Uh, but before we get to that, it seems like a lot has happened this week. You know, you get some some weeks which are, uh, you know, slow news weeks, and you get some weeks where everything seems to explode. And this is one of those weeks where it seems like everything seems to have exploded. Uh, but let me go through a few articles. There are just a, a few things that I wanted to share with you um, in case you haven't seen them already. Uh, not that one. Um, there we go. Um, so, yeah, the first thing is, like I mentioned last week, I did a, an interview um, with Julian from the Mind Renewed podcast. And uh, it's called Is Satan Woke? And um, let me just read out the, the blurb from it. Strange as it might seem, given that Phil's ordained and I'm a Methodist lay preacher, this time we centre our conversation in the character of Satan, or the Satan, to be more precise. Reflecting upon the clear manifestation of evil in the world, particularly over the last three years, and trying to make sense of the strange, seemingly ubiquitous eruption of what one might call woke sensibilities in recent times, we discuss questions such as who or what is the Satan? What does he do? What sort of influence does he have in the world? Where did he come from? Has he always been this way? What is that serpent in the Garden of Eden narrative anyway? Um, so there we go. That's um, that's the, the blurb for it. So do have a look at that if you are interested. We're kind of riffing on some of the things that I've been talking about on the podcast over the last few weeks. But uh, we, we kind of go into some different areas and think about how that sort of connects with, with woke as well. So, yeah, do have a look at that. Um there's an article Brendan O'Neill wrote on Spiked called uh, It's a Heat Wave, Not the End of the World. And uh, there have been a few articles like this, but if you have noticed it, the, the way that the, the BBC and other mainstream media publications are reporting the hot weather over the last few weeks, it, it's got apocalyptic overtones. You know, that whereas in the past, some years ago, 10 or so years ago, temperatures of 30 degrees or more would have just been reported quite you know um without any fanfare these days you know now the hot weather is reported with deep shades of red on the map and it, it all looks like it's apocalyptic and people are fleeing from this hot weather uh, i just think it's a bit ridiculous you know and, and brendan o'neill has written about this and other people have written about this too um so yeah do have a look at that but it seems it's just another one of these ways in which we are being manipulated into into supporting the government's uh, net zero and climate change agenda which is to terrify people into thinking that hot weather is somehow the apocalypse um, as much as i'm not a huge fan of the hot weather uh <laughs> i think you know it hasn't been well it hasn't actually really been hot here for quite a while we had a week or two of hot weather, didn't we? And then it all got a bit cold again. Um, typical Britain. But uh, yeah, anyway, do have a look at that article. Um, there was an article by Emma Webb, which uh, is titled, Britain is no country for Christians. And the subtitle is, The suspension of a Tory councillor hints at a growing intolerance for our official religion. And I think this is another good article, um, and she's talking about actually not just, you know, what's happening in the country, but what's happening in the Church of England. You know, where are the Church of England? Where's the Archbishop actually standing up for the rights of um, of people who are being persecuted for their faith? Such as this councillor, King Lowell, a Tory councillor who's just been suspended and is under investigation by the conser uh, by Conservative HQ um, because he he put something on Twitter against Pride. Um, so, yeah, that's a good article by Emma Webb. And I think that she's 
absolutely right in that we are, you know, the country is becoming increasingly intolerant of Christians. Uh, and uh, something which I didn't include in this, actually, which has also happened this week, is that there is a one of the um, major kind of buildings in, in London is now being converted into a mosque, has been bought and is now being converted into a mosque. The name of the building escapes me. Um, I oh, will come back to me. But yes, a big building in London is being converted into a mosque. And uh, I think that says it all, really, doesn't it? That, you know, we're, we're no, it's no place for Christians anymore. But if you're a Muslim, hey, that's great. And, uh, you know, you get welcomed with open arms by the liberal establishment. Although for how long, um, as we've seen, the, you know, the conflict between like, LGBT and conservative Muslims, you know, I, I don't think they've quite worked that one out yet. Um, so, you know, I think there's there's more to come on that. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we will see. Um, the last bit of news, and this was big news this week, is that um, Nigel Farage had his, uh, I think I mentioned this last week, or it was a couple of weeks ago that the news broke, that Nigel Farage had his bank account closed um, by Coots, who are uh, basically, uh, as far as I can understand, a bank for posh people, um, the royal family have their banking with with Coots, and Coots are part of the NatWest Group, um, which were bailed out by the taxpayer back in two thousand and eight. So I think NatWest are now about forty percent publicly owned. Um, but Nigel Farage, he wasn't told the real reason why he um, he was his account was was cancelled. So he put in a subject access request, which is a I think the GDPR thing where you can request what information an organisation has about you. He put in a subject access request for all the information about him held by Coots, and he found that they'd had a meeting in November last year about whether to, to cancel his account. And they said that, um, well, th they basically said his values don't align with ours. We are inclusive and, and um, oh, I can't, you know, diverse or what have you. But it says things like, you know, he's seen as xenophobic and racist. He's considered by many to be a disingenuous grifter. Uh, this is, these aren't words of a serious organisation. You know, these are the words of a of, of Twitter. You know, it, it's just so utterly ludicrous that, that someone could have a bank account closed. Not to mention the fact that they told the BBC and the Financial Times that the reason his bank account was closed was because he um, he didn't have enough money, basically, that he wasn't economically, you know, in good enough shape to have an account with Coots. So I think it's utterly, utterly wrong that what they've done. And I hope that they will be made to pay. But I hope that more and more people see what is happening because, you know, this kind of stuff is happening all across the board now. And it's a worrying world where someone can get their account cancelled for expressing the wrong views. And, you know, I know Nigel Farage is someone who is in the public eye, but there are many people, uh, it's saying, who, who've had their accounts closed in smaller ways, people who don't have his profile. Um so there we go. That's that's something which is, um, yeah, do have a look at look at. There's an article there from the Telegraph, but um, that he's, he's talked about it on um, GB News. There are lots of other things as well. So um, if you Google it, if you haven't seen that, there's lots of things. The final thing I wanted to mention was an interview on trigonometry. This is a trigonometry employee called Sophie Spittle. And um, she was interviewed a few days ago. And um, what was interesting about her is that she is autistic um, and also a Christian. Uh, but she, for um, many, many years, uh, didn't really acknowledge her kind of femininity. And, 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 you know, she just didn't think about it, I suppose. And I think she says and she said that if she had been a you know going through the teenage years now it's almost certain that she would have been transitioned would have been encouraged to transition um her you know gender identity or or, or whatever and um yeah that's a really good interview she's a very um thoughtful person she's got a lot of had a lot of good things to say but one of the the things from 
my perspective that I thought was most interesting. They didn't really pick up on this because I know that, you know, um, uh, Constantine and Francis aren't Christian themselves, although they, they are sympathetic. But because Sophie's a Christian, you know, she, she had some good insights from it from a Christian perspective. One of the things that really struck me, actually, the thing that most struck me, really, was how she found kind of a peace and acceptance, not through her being encouraged in her gender identity, in kind of transitioning, um, in the way that modern progressives do, but actually in accepting what the Bible says and accepting that there are male and female. And it sounds to me like she had some very wise and godly pastors who really helped her. But they were wise and godly, sort of from the traditional and biblical perspective, of course. And, um, you know, it seems to me that as someone who's in the, the Church of England, or who was up until recently, sorry, in the Church of England, but who's now is still kind of, I'm still, you know, keeping an eye on what's going on. We are constantly told by people in the church that we've got to change or die. That, you know, if we don't change to affirm in inverted commas, LGB, all the LGBT stuff, then we're just going to die out and everyone will leave the church. And what I think was really helpful about this interview was it showed that Sophie actually found peace through embracing the tradition, embracing the Bible, embracing what it what it says, rather than going against it down the, the, the liberal sort of progressive road. And I've seen that story repeated many times, but it, it very rarely gets publicised in the media. You know, the people's, people who um, who get into the media are the people who've committed suicide because, you know, they wouldn't, um, the church wouldn't affirm them or something like that. You know, I mean, that's rare. It has happened. And whenever it's happened, you know, it's been all over the BBC, of course. But someone who finds peace and acceptance by embracing their bodies, by embracing the way that they were created as a woman or, you know, as a man, rather than transitioning, that doesn't get into the media. And um, so, yeah, I thought that was a really good interview anyway. And really, um, yeah, she's a thoughtful woman. And I thought it was great about, you know, everything that's been that's been happening, especially thinking about it sort of from a Christian perspective, too. Um so, yeah, do do have a look at that. So that's all that the the news and, and the what have you for this week. Um, do let me know if there's anything else that uh, that's interesting. Leave a comment below so other people can have a look as well. Um, or you can telegram me. Telegram link is down below. Or you can email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com. And uh, while I'm on the subjects of the, uh, the, the news, if you... Um, like the podcast and you'd like to support it if you're listening on the audio podcast please do leave me a rating uh, a review if you have the time as that would really help other people to find the podcast um, do click the like button if you're on youtube there's also a buy me a coffee link and i really appreciate all of your you know comments uh, emails what have you getting in touch um, i'm so pleased to know that you know what i'm doing here is is beneficial and you know people are appreciating it and continuing to find it just thinking through what's going on in the world from a christian perspective so yeah that's great well let's move on now to think about our main topic to think about uh, artificial intelligence so i've called this what should we make of artificial intelligence or what should we make of ai um, as it's usually shortened um, so let me just give you a bit of background in this area um, it may or may not surprise you to know I'm a computer science graduate. Um, so that was what I first trained in um, before, um, after I, I graduated, I worked in um, software development for a few years and then I left that and then trained for theological training and trained for um, ordained ministry. Um, but my first, first degree was in, in computer science. And um, I put a picture there, if you're watching on YouTube, a picture of a, a little robot with, with wheels, because um, that was one of the things that I had to do in my computer science course. I had to look into robotics and, um, well, actually, I didn't have to. It was a choice. I wanted to. And um, I, I got it to, um, I had to get a robot to take a, a ball from, there was a sort of a two or three meter square little um pitch and I had to get a robot to take a ball pick up a ball find it pick up a ball and put it into the net and the ball could be in one of a number of different in any sort of position really 
Uh, quite a challenge. You will be surprised at how difficult it is to get a robot to do even basic things like that. And that's one of the big things that I learned actually from my um, computer science degree, which is if, if you want to find out how smart human beings are, you just need to try and get a computer to do something that, that what humans can do, particularly in, in that way. As I think that my experience there just left me, I, I think, more or, you know, in awe of human beings at how how complex human beings are, how you know well designed human beings are. You know, the human eye, you know, is, is more complex than any camera ever created. You know, the human brain, uh, again, you know, that there's so much that a human being can do, even even a, a young infant, and that even the most advanced computers uh, can't do. I think computers are a useful tool, but they are no match for a human being. Um, and, you know, so I, I suppose I just wanted to come at this. Um, I didn't study artificial intelligence, although it was around. Uh, I went to, to uni sort of not too long after The Matrix was first released. And, of course, that was all the big thing at the time. You know, the um, will will machines take over um, human beings? That was a that was a talk, you know, back 20 years ago. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I suppose what I wanted to, the reason I wanted to mention this was just because I, I suppose I do have slightly more qualification to talk in this area than I do in some areas, um, but not very much, but I, I just wanted to give that background. So what do we make of chat GPT? Can we, can we call them intelligent? Um, what the, the the thing with ChatGPT and these sort of chatbots is that they are essentially technologically advanced search engines. So they are not trying to actually understand the world and to to kind of make a model of the world to understand it themselves and to to work out what's going on. Essentially, what chatbots like ChatGPT are doing is to synthesize information which is already there which is already created so they they don't um you know try and get new information or they don't try and work out what's true they just kind of do it what an intelligent synthesis of information which is already out there so um i don't think there is any danger of you know terminator robots going rogue for example, uh, I, I don't think we're in any danger of that anytime soon or any or anything like that. And in fact, I think perhaps artificial intelligence is not quite the right name for what we have, because I'm not sure that you could really call it intelligence. It's it's not it's not intelligence in the sense of, you know, discerning something new or, or thinking for for yourself. It's more about trying to to work out what other people have done and, and looking at a series of data and trying to, um, you know, to kind of work out um, what someone might do based on that series of data. But it's not really, I think, intelligence in the way that we would normally use it of human beings. I think that you can basically um, get this if you think about the way that we did envision um, what artificial intelligence and machines might look like in sci-fi films from the, the 20th century. So there's a, an author I like called uh, Max Barry, and he wrote a blog just this, uh, the other day, um, which is called Everyone Except Me is Wrong About AI. So let me quote you a little bit where he compares AI to C-3PO from uh, Star, Trek, uh, Star Wars. Oh gosh, don't, not Star Trek, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get lynched. Um, let me quote you what he says. Chatbots are good at figuring out what comes next when you start a sentence with the capital of Antigua is. That's pretty cool. We didn't have that before. But it's not intelligence. It's almost the opposite of intelligence. Like the difference between the kid in high school who was always studying and that guy who never studied but could talk and is now a real estate agent. Both can sound smart, but only one knows what he's talking about. By the way, it's very on brand for Earth 2023 that our robots are designed to sound plausible rather than be correct. 
Remember in Star Wars how C-3PO delivered a precise survival probability of flying into an asteroid field, 3720 to 1. And Han Solo was like, shut up C-3PO, because he was too cool and handsome to be bothered by math. Or so we thought, because that was the kind of AI we were imagining in the 1980s. AI that was, before anything else, correct. But if C-3PO was a chatbot, no wonder Han had no time for his nonsense. All C-3PO could do was regurgitate what other people tended to say about surviving asteroid fields on average. I think that he, he puts the, his finger on, on, uh, finger on the, the nail, it hits the nail on the head. That um, won't mix my metaphors. The difference between C-3PO and the modern chatbot is C-3PO had a kind of independent intelligence that he worked out things, he had the data and he, he was able to do the maths, he knew what the probability was of surviving an asteroid field. Whereas a modern chatbot, all that could do is just synthesise information about what other people say about surviving asteroid fields. So that is the difference, isn't it? That, you know, a, a, a modern uh, AI chatbot can only synthesise information and we don't even know whether it's correct. You know, it can't actually synthesise, uh, you know, sort through contrasting opinions and say this is correct and this is not correct. It can't get to the truth because all it knows is what people have said. So, um, for example, if there was a lot on the internet about, um, well, let's take the Nigel Farage thing, which I mentioned earlier. Did Nigel Farage take money from the Russians? It, you know, it seems to me that there was no evidence that he did. And when Chris Bryant raised the matter using parliamentary privilege, it was, um, you know, pretty, uh, well, it was pretty disgraceful, actually, that it was effectively lying because there was no evidence for it. And yet that claim has been repeated now on on social media. So how could ChatGPT or, or an AI chatbot know the difference? How could it know what the truth actually is? is it has to be able to sort through that and it, it doesn't have that that capability so that's some something which is important to understand about a chatbot it just is processing information rather than actually thinking about it now there's been a lot of talk about whether ai is dangerous and i think that you know as with any technology ai is a powerful tool and I suppose because AI is perhaps at the, the moment particularly powerful because it has access to all of this data and processing power, which wasn't available in times gone by, then yes, I think it is a particularly powerful tool, maybe one which, you know, more powerful in some ways than any which has come before. At the same time, whether it's good or bad, it depends on whoever is using it. If you think about it, you know, through the, the 20th century, nuclear technology, you know, that was a, a new technology. And, you know, you can use it to power a nuclear reactor, to power a city, or you can use it to build a bomb and destroy the city. So, you know, nuclear technology isn't good or bad, but it depends on who's building it, who's using that technology. It can be used for good or for evil. And it's the same with AI that AI um, could be used for, for evil. And I've, I've heard people talking about it, for example, that AI could be trained to examine people's social media and work out who has incorrect political views and then, you know, cancel them. So for, um, going back to the Nigel Farage thing with, with Coots, that could happen to more of us because AI could work out who had the wrong views and then, um, you know, send them letters saying we've cancelled your account. Sorry. So that that could happen. And in fact, I think um, Nigel Farage mentioned on the, on his show that the the parent or not not a parent company, but a company that was used by NatWest and others to assess risk were training AI to look at your social media posts to see who was a risk and who wasn't. Um, so that is a worrying development. And of course, that, that is a bad use of AI if it's used to cancel people. On the flip side, AI could have 
um, beneficial uses as well. Uh, many beneficial uses. One, I mean, as I was thinking about this, there are so many that you could have. Um, but for example, the ability to train AI to, to help distribute emergency services and aid after a disaster, or, or perhaps just more generally, you know, it could actually be used to help humanity um, for good purposes rather than for evil ones. So as with any new technology, there are pros and cons. It could be it could be used for good, it could be used for evil. The problem is not with the technology itself, it's with the, the person, the people who are using it, controlling it and developing it. And I think new technology often takes time to find its own level. You know, the the think about just about any new technology which has which has come in over the you know the past century and virtually everything there's been a panic about you know, there was a panic about tv when tv first came in because people thought that tv would turn everyone into idiots uh, well actually all right well let's <laughs> let's not go down that road uh, perhaps the problem is not it's not tv itself though is it it's it's how it's used and you know people panicked about the internet and people panicked about nu te nuclear technology. So, you know, panicking, I'm saying let's not panic. You know, this is this is about people and how we use the technology, not the technology itself. Now, could AI replace a human being? And um, I think this is another thing which is one of those yes and no questions that I think um, there are aspects of of um, AI which where you could say that's uh, that's a yes and you know that's always been the case that technology has always inverted commas replaced human beings you know if you think about farming machinery for example where before you might have needed hundreds of people to harvest crops now you have a combine harvester which can do it in you know a fraction of the time and with a fraction of the people um, you think about production lines you know mass production and again, you know, whereas in the past that was all done by hand, now you have robots, now you have uh, machines to do that kind of thing. Um, so again, I think, you know, this is nothing new that artificial intelligence is at all like any other and it has uses. And in as we've seen in the past, uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, technology has replaced jobs, but then, it, you know, things adjust. I think AI could and, and will be a huge uh, disruption but we've had big disruptions before and you know things have changed and and I'm sure things will settle down um, you know I, I don't think it's anything to be to be worried about in in that respect um, at the same time I think AI is not possible uh, it's not possible for AI to replace a human being because however advanced technology gets we cannot create anything in the image of God. That's what uh, the Bible says about human beings. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. It's a verse we, uh, we've we looked at a lot on the podcast. And it's one which um, I think we need to keep coming back to. Because I think that one verse has probably influenced humanity more than... Uh, influenced the Western world, sorry. More than anything else over the course of Western civilization. That human beings are all equally created in the image of God. Such an important verse. And it says that as well, we as human beings are not capable of creating anything in the image of God because we are not gods. Uh, contrary to the likes of Yuval Harari, who think that technology is the answer to all of humanity's problems. We are not gods. We cannot create in the image of God. That a, a human being, at the end of the day, every human being has a spark of the divine. But everything made by human beings will be just a, you know, a technological creation. And like I said about, um, you know, about me years ago making my little robot move a, a ball around into a goal. You know, that it, try and get a computer to do anything that even a, a newborn or even a, you know, a toddler can do. And you'll find it virtually impossible to do that. You know, human beings are unique and you, you know, even with with processing information, you know, a computer can process information, but it can't think about it. It doesn't have values. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have the power to get to the truth. 
So, you know, that the, we are made in the image of God. And I don't believe any machine will ever be be created that can actually uh, substitute for that because human beings are unique. And the important thing with human beings is that relationships are of fundamental importance, how we relate to other people. And this is what I wanted to come on to. The difference between an I-thou and an I-it relationship. So uh, let me explain what this is. Um, there, are, uh, there was a philosopher called Martin Buber from the 20th century who um, came up with this distinction. I'll, I'll just quote to you what the uh, Britannica Encyclopedia has to say online um, about I, thou, and then I'll, then I'll try and explain. I, thou, theological doctrine of the full, direct, mutual relation between beings, as conceived by Martin Buber and some other 20th century philosophers. The basic and purest form of this relation is that between man and God, the eternal thou, which is the model for and makes possible I-thou relationships between human beings. The relation between man and God, however, is always an I-thou one, whereas that between man and man is very frequently an I-it one, in which the other being is treated as an object of thought or action. According to Buber, Man's relation to other creatures may sometimes approach or even enter the I-Thou realm. Buber's book, It Can Do, 1923, is the classic work on the subject. So what Buber was saying is that our relationships can be either I-Thou or I-It. I-Thou is the kind of the fullest and deepest relationship where we, where we actually recognise the, the 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 fullness of the the personhood i suppose of the other person where we you know perhaps you could think of a a, a deep friendship a marriage relationship um you know where we really connect on on a deep level and where we fully kind of enter into that 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 relationship and and Buber was saying that the the deepest relationship the i thou relationship we have is with god but he says that the other kind of relationship is an i it relationship where we're not really recognising the personhood of the other person, but it's sort of transactional. It's, you know, just for, for convenience, it's for contract. Like when you go into a shop, you, you know, you buy a packet of sweets or whatever it is, you know, you give the money to the, the person on the till and, um, you know, that it's just kind of a transactional thing. So you're not really recognising the personhood of the other, the other person. It could, it could be done by a machine. And in fact, as we see in supermarkets, that role has been largely replaced by machines, by the, you know, by the checkouts. Because, you know, I think actually partly it's because people don't like to deal with someone at a checkout. Um, quite, anyway, we'll maybe come on to that. Um, but, yeah, I think that's what's fundamental about human beings. It's relational. And you can't have a relationship with a machine. You can't recognise the personhood of a machine. Because every, every person is unique, made in the image of God, and has thoughts, feelings, you know, emotions and experiences and, you know, just a, a, a full fullness of character, which a machine cannot have. It can emulate to some extent, but it cannot actually have. So we can't actually have those kind of I-thou relationships with a robot or with artificial intelligence. Um, and the problem comes when I would say the biggest problem and the biggest danger of AI is going to come when people think that AI can actually replace human relationships. And that kind of brings me on to an article that I saw this week, which I think is actually probably the most worrying thing about AI that I've read. Um, it's It was on The Telegraph and it was titled A Relationship with Another Human is Overrated Inside the Rise of AI Girlfriends. Subtitle, Millions of uh, Mostly Men Are Carrying Out Relationships with a, a Chatbot Partner But It's Not All Love and Happiness. Uh, so let me quote you a little bit, uh, a little bit of what the article says. The project spawned Replica, 
Today, 10 million people have downloaded the app and created digital companions. Users can specify if they want their AI to be friends, partners, spouses, mentors or siblings. More than 250,000 pay for Replica's Pro version, which lets users make voice and video calls with their AI, start families with them, and receive the aforementioned intimate selfies. Now just let that sink in. This is not some kind of tiny fad. 10 million people have downloaded this app, and a quarter of a million pay for the Pro version, where you can talk on the phone, even have intimate selfies uh, with them. Isn't that incredible? That people are so lonely that they would actually pay AI in order to, to you know, pretend, basically, to have a relationship. And some people actually find this preferable. I think this is, I would say, this is the real danger of AI. And that is where people think it's, uh, it, it, it's a real human relationship, it's a real human being, but it is not. And that's because, as, as we saw with, with Martin Buber, you can't have a I-thou relationship with a, with a machine. And I think that the fact that people are trying just shows that, you know, in many people's minds, the role of a human being has become like a machine. You know, we think like machines, we, you know, everything is reduced to social media, on the internet and, and everything. You know, it, as human beings, we just, we don't see each other as humans anymore. That if you think that artificial intelligence is as good as a an actual human relationship, then you have no idea and you, you must have a very low view of human beings. And so I think this is a deeply troubling uh, development. And this is the thing I would say, which was the the most worrying thing about AI, which is that, you know, people thinking AI is a substitute for a real human relationship. Not about using AI as a tool. You know, a tool can be used for good or evil. But AI can't be used as a person, be related to as a person. And, and, and that's, yeah, that's where we are. So let me close out with a few reflections. Uh, what should Christians make of AI? Um, well, I think there are, um, again, another verse that we've looked at, but that the next verse in Genesis chapter one, actually, where God says to fill the earth and subdue it. That's often called the creation or the, the cultural mandate, which is that God wants us as human beings to use our brains, to, to develop technology, to, you know, to develop tools. Uh, I mean, everything, you know, art, culture, you know, God wants all of those things to happen. And that's all good if it's done in the right ways, of course. And I think that AI, you know, it's just one of those tools. It's, it's part of that technology. There is nothing bad about developing technology per se. So that's the first thing I would say. The problem is not with the technology, but with the wickedness of the heart which operates the technology. And that's something we've seen all the way through the centuries, haven't we? That technology, you know, iron working could be used to make farming tools or it could be used to make swords and, and weapons of war. And, you know, we've, we've always had this, that a, a, a tool can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And that tools are neutral. And I think artificial intelligence is a tool. It is a powerful tool. And perhaps that's the reason why people are, are more worried about it, because it because of the access to the, the data that it has, it's maybe a, a more powerful tool than one before. And so it could become a more powerful weapon. Uh, that is understandable. And I think that's something that we will see. It remains to be seen yet. But we also, I think, as Christians, need to remember that um, fears may be liars. That was a quote, actually, I came across in my... Um, preparing for my sermon last week fears may be liars and I think that's a good um, a good thing to remember for life um, but it, it, I think it's important to remember when it comes to looking at these big things as well 
that remember that our fears haven't come to pass with nuclear war. My wife um, says that when she was young, you know, growing up, I guess, at the, um, the latter part of the Cold War, that, you know, she was terrified about nuclear war. But nuclear war, you know, that hasn't come to pass. You know, nuclear weapons were used once in history um, and they haven't been used since. Um, God, you know, by the grace of God. And I think that is the way that we need to look at these things, that any powerful technology has the ability to be apocalyptic. And the more powerful technology gets, the more apocalyptic it will be able to be. So, yes, nuclear weapons could wipe out the world. AI could, I mean, could be used to enslave, um, you know, if, if, if things sort of um, are as bad as they could be. But I think as Christians, we need to trust that things will not get to that point. There's a verse in um, Genesis, again, a bit later in Genesis, just after the flood, where God says to Noah, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. And we need to remember that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And that, you know, it's his say what happens at the end of the day that it's not going to be nuclear explosions it's not going to be ai which destroys the world but god and his judgment alone will have the power to do that ai or new te nuclear technology doesn't have the power to do what god doesn't want it to do so that's that's something really important to remember and there's a lovely verse in psalm 34 which says i sought the lord and he answered me he delivered me from all my fears and we need to remember that with God, it's not that fears are liars. All fears are liars for Christians. And I think that's, again, an important thing to remember in life in general. Uh, but especially when we approach the big changes in life, the big, the big things which are going on, we need to not fear. You know, do not fear, the most important sort of oft-repeated command in the Bible. Do not fear. The most important thing that we need to do is as Jesus uh, Jesus told us. This is um, uh, from uh, Matthew's Gospel. We'll finish with this, finish this section with this. Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's something which is, uh, as Jesus says, the most important commandment is to love. And to love means that going back to Martin Buber, we have those I-thou relationships. We need to treat other people not in a transactional way, but as human beings. And I think the more that we can do that, the more that people will recognise the the uh, paucity, you know, how AI really is, is such a sham compared to real human relationships, if we ourselves have real human relationships. And especially in church, you know, I think that it's important in our in our churches to build real, healthy, genuine human relationships. I thou relationships with people. That's what it means to love. And that is where I think people will recognise that AI is not all it's cracked up to be. And AI cannot actually um, substitute for genuine love. So I remember I doing a, um, a podcast a few months ago called it love is our resistance and i think as so many other things you know all of the things going on in the world the authoritarianism the the fear you know all of that it's it's designed to shut down love that's what it's it's designed to do and what we need to do is we need to uh, to love and not be shut down we need to love and it's that that will be our witness um and our stand against the unhelpful um ways that AI is used and uh, many other things too. Well let's move on now to think about a reflection from the Bible. So 
Um, just a short one this week. This was a little passage that I read um, this morning, actually. I've been reading through uh, 1 Chronicles, and I found it quite striking. Lots of different bits of it, but um, I'm just going to read a few verses. So this is from 1 Chronicles chapter, uh, where was it, from um, chapter 11, uh, verses 12 to 14. There we go. So 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verses 12 to 14. Just a short one um, today, but I think a really, a really helpful one. Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai the Aho Ahohite, one of the three mighty warriors. He was with David at Pas Damim when the Philistines gathered there for battle. At a place where there was a field full of barley, the troops fled from the Philistines. But they took their stand in the middle of the field. They defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, I think this is a really helpful um, passage because what it says, there, there are two things that I was struck by when reading this passage. The first thing is that the, um, the men who were left, the mighty men, as they're called, they, you know, the army deserted them. You know, the army fled from, from their enemies, from the Philistines. But they were brave and courageous. They stood in the middle of the field and they defended it. They did not give up. And I think that's the first lesson. You know, that all the way through the centuries, God's people have always faced overwhelming odds. Always been the case. Stand firm. Be courageous. Do not be moved. Hold your line. And and the victory will come. Uh, I don't think we have to worry that it, it seems that, you know, the whole world is going astray. The whole world is going crazy. Uh, because it's always been like that. You know, the, the, the odds have always been against us. But we just need to hold the line. Keep firm. Keep firm in the truth. Keep firm in what's right. And it says, the Lord brought about a great victory. That at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about the number of people, but the victory belongs to God. He just needs people to be courageous and to stand firm. And I think that's that was so encouraging for me, you know, that uh, it's so easy to think, you know, well, what can little old me do? You know, um, I, I don't have much influence. Um you know, and maybe you think the same thing, you know, what can little old me do? And yet we know that God can bring about the victory. He just needs people like you and me to stand firm, to stand firm on him, to stand firm in righteousness and stand for the truth, stand against the lies and against all of the, the toxic things that are happening. We just need to stand for righteousness, for love, all of that. And the Lord can and will uh, bring about victory. Um, so that, that was my encouragement today. Just stand firm. Hold your line. Don't worry if everyone else seems to be deserting you. That's all God needs. You know, we've always faced overwhelming odds. But the victory is not about the number of people, but it's about God. And so we just need to stand firm. Now let's take a moment to pray as we come to the end of the podcast and uh, commit these things to God. And so, Heavenly Father, we uh, do pray as we are facing a world which is changing. Uh, particularly, we think about artificial intelligence today and about the ways that that could be used for good or evil. And we pray that the this technology would be used for what is good and right. And that we pray, Lord, that those developing this technology would um, commit to doing what is good. And that we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to stand against the, the ways that we are reduced as human beings and... Um, uh, to, to just treating each other as an as an it. Uh, we pray that you would help us in our, all our relationships to treat one another uh, with love, uh, with those sort of I-thou uh, relationships. Help us to have deep relationships. Help us to stand firmly against this, um, um, you know, treating just treating one another like machines, like society does. And we pray that you would help us to stand firm in the truth, to stand firm when it comes to what's going on, and uh, we pray that you would help us to not worry about odds that might, might seem overwhelming, but to trust you and know that the victory belongs to you. So please help us and bless us in these coming days. And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, everyone. Um, this is the beginning of the summer uh, holidays um, for me, so that you know my um, my kids finished uh, school yesterday. Uh, I'm going to keep the podcast going. I am um, not going to be doing much on understand the Bible on my other channel over the holidays, but I will uh, try and keep the podcast going. But I, I will be on holiday for a couple of weeks in August, um, so I probably won't be doing a podcast every week. Uh, and it may be a little bit stripped down as well, uh, but I'll have to see. If there's anything that you'd like me to look at in the podcast, though, do let me know. Uh, thanks for people who've got in touch. Uh, like I said, do, um, you know, telegram me, comment me, uh, email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com. And, um, yeah, the don't forget the uh, rating, review, like, buy me a coffee link as well if you want to support the podcast. Thanks so much, everyone. God bless. And I'll see you again soon.